Okay, good morning. Um, I can welcome you all to our latest class uh, lecture on Europeanization processes in Southeastern Europe. Um, it's a great pleasure to introduce Natasha Wunsch today, who is an assistant professor at the Sciences Po in Paris and also affiliated with the ETH in Zurich. Um, and um, she's going to be presenting um, uh, a paper on uh, the dark side of EU conditionality, money, power, and glory, the linkages between EU conditionality and state capture in the Western Balkans. It's also based on some research she's published together with uh, Zolbeck Richter um, uh, recently. And so she will be introducing this more, let's say, in a certain way, critical perspectives on the, the, the downsides or the problems, especially EU conditionality is facing at the moment. So for all of the participants, you're welcome to ask questions in the chat and also in person. So for that, you can just use your raise your hand function um, or turn on your camera and microphone after the presentation when we'll have plenty of time for a discussion. So, Natasha, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Florian. Thank you very much for, uh, for the invitation, to, for the opportunity to, um, to present this, uh, this piece of research um, here. Um, as you said, indeed, uh, and, uh, and the, the title I provided initially for the presentation is this idea of dark sides of conditionality to kind of look into um, not just uh, why conditionality um, has perhaps been less successful in fostering democratic transformation in the Balkans, but perhaps even into um, more negative impacts of um, the, the way that the EU has been using conditionality um, in the region. So. Um, the, um, the background to our research um, is, uh, of course, first of all, this realization that um, EU conditionality has had comparatively limited effects in the Western Balkans. Um, these countries were offered an, uh, an EU membership um, perspective, meanwhile, um, over two decades ago. So just to kind of think of how long this, um, um, this process is already going on with um, in terms of um, democratization outcomes, but also in terms of progress towards actual EU membership, indeed not um, as bright, uh, perhaps a success story as may have been the case in um, Central and Eastern Europe. And what we um, what we kind of take as a, as a starting point for our research is to say, it's not just about stagnation. So it's not just that the process itself, perhaps also due to um, some failings on the part of the Western Balkans um, is stagnating uh, or, or uh, more sluggish, but we actually see even a decline in the democratic quality um, uh, in the region. So the kind of democratic backsliding that we started discussing um, in the case of um, Hungary and then uh, later Poland is also now um, pretty clearly be um, visible in several of the um, countries of the region. And this despite, and this is then um, really, really the puzzle that we uh, seek to tackle conceptually, despite the fact that formally Although progress is sluggish, progress is happening. So we do have, of course, Croatia as um, the country that has um, been able to enter the EU, um, but also the, the formal progress is still in place. And unlike the case of um, Turkey, where there's really been a, um, a formal a recognition, official recognition of a kind of need to suspend the progress, we are still kind of opening and closing chapters. There are these regular meetings and um, we also see when we, when we zoom into um, actual compliance patterns, that compliance, according to um, the Commission's access, um, um, assessment is progressing. So I'll, I'll um, unpack this a little bit empirically later on. Now, the big question is, of course, why? Why do we see um, the, this, this decoupling effectively of um, formal progress, formal compliance and decline in democratic quality at the same time? And uh, we have a number, uh, um, of course, of um, previous um, models, previous theoretical explanations um, for uh, compliance patterns um, in enlargement countries. The most prominent of which certainly is um, the external incentives model, so the, the kind of classical um, Schimmelfennig and Zedelmeier um, emphasis on domestic cost benefit calculations where then quite simply the assumption would be, um, obviously there is uh, not enough of an incentive, um, perhaps not a strong enough credibility of um, the membership perspective for the Western Balkans to engender the kind of very costly um, uh, politically related um, reforms. A second argument that has been introduced to um, complement this external incentives model is to say, um, certainly this, this does play a role, this central role of um, domestic elites and making these uh, transformation choices. 
But perhaps um, in the case of the Western Balkans, because of um, the, the past, the violent disintegration of Yugoslavia, etc., there are some conditions that actually go even deeper than um, the kind of formal or political um, transformation and that really cut into um, national identity and um, uh, that, that are perceived domestically really as um, unacceptable. Um, most prominently here, the um, cooperation with the International Criminal Tribunal for Reform Yugoslavia, which is of course much less salient today because um, this, this is more or less um, out of the way um, in a sense, but which certainly also played a role um, in, the, in the early compliance patterns to say some of the demands that the EU was placing on the region were very hard to digest um, for, for elites, but also for those parts of the um, population that they were able to convince of their views. And then the third point, um, and this goes to um, some of the work also that uh, we've been doing in the in the context of the Balkans and Europe um, Policy Advisory Group that that Florian pilots is this notion of conflicting objectives. So the EU is really pursuing two objectives at the same time in the Balkans from the start: stability versus democracy, and really versus in the sense that often these do these two do come into conflict and lead to a certain number of um, arbitrations on the part of the European Commission that perhaps leads to a less consistent application of, of conditionality, which may explain um, less consistent patterns than of compliance on the, um, on the part of the target countries. Nonetheless, we feel that while these three explanations allow to explain why there's been a lack of progress, they don't really offer a sufficient insight into what we um, what we term the, the actual decoupling between formal compliance on the one hand and then democratic backsliding on the other. And so the, um, the literature that we speak to here is the one on um, outright pathological effects of Europeanization. So really to say, certainly not intentionally, but nonetheless, inadvertently, um, the way that conditionality is being used um, towards the Western, Western Balkans has globally had um, not only a lack of positive effects, but also in certain domains, um, these kind of pathological negative effects um, on, the, on the region's progress, on the region's um, level of democracy. So this is, um, this is kind of the background. And then um, if we turn to the, um, to the empirical side of the argument, we really wanted to to measure, so not just to kind of point out things are going slow, or there there there's um there's a slowdown or this overall slowdown of the accession process, but really to um to empirically demonstrate this pattern of decoupling that we felt was um, was present, decoupling again between um, formally making these um, progresses um, towards the accession, um, yet on the other hand experiencing um, increasingly visible, I would say, um, declines in liberal democracy. And so what you have in this graph here is um, change over time. So starting from um, the, the early 2000s, presumably even the late um, 1990s um, to the, the time, I think it goes up to 2018 in this study. And my, my, my assumption is that these um, curves largely continue, these curves largely continue in the same direction um, for, the, for the past few years. But so you have time on the x-axis and on the y-axis you have um, levels of compliance on the one hand with EU membership criteria, so the red line, um, and on the other with liberal democracy. Uh, and uh, so how do we how do we measure this? Of course, through um, relatively concept, uh, complex concepts. Um, the, the compliance, we uh, really went into the, um, the EU Commission's uh, um, annual progress reports, or no longer progress reports, but meanwhile only um, annual reports due to a lack of progress. But when you do look into these, and, and we did it for all um, 35 chapters, and we had um, we had coders, um, we actually extended an existing data set, data set from from Bimelton Freiburg until um, the time that we ended our study. Where coders really went so into each of the chapters and looked through um, this um, kind of heavy bureaucratic um, EU language of um, there was some progress, there was a little progress, there was not so much progress, and really allocated um, these these coding decisions by year and by chapter. For each of the countries and um, and then so created basically this um, this trend line that you see here for the entire region that does point to the fact that on the basis of the commission's report there has been a relatively steady progress um, towards meeting formal accession criteria across the region and i'll go into country level patterns in a moment for the, um, the measure of democracy, we use um, liber um, the, the liberal democracy um, index from the Varietas Democracy data set, which we consider to be a kind of state of the art, very, very complex, very um, complete also um, index, perhaps uh, somewhat more compelling for academic studies than um, competitors from uh, Freedom House or, um, or the Economist Intelligence Index. Although we also do as a, um, as a, uh, 
robustness check run um, these alternative indices and find the same, um, obviously, trends of democratic backsliding. So this is this is a pattern at the um, at the regional level. We have um, reasonably straightforward uh, regular progress in meeting form like session criteria, and just as clear decline um, again at the regional level of liberal democracy. Now, if we look into the individual country patterns, they occasionally look somewhat more um, um, more complex, or in the case of Bosnia, perhaps less. Um, complex. So perhaps starting here with, with Bosnia, because it's uh, a bit of a striking case here, we really have stagnation across the board, both both when it comes to um, formal criteria and to democracy at an extremely low level. So the democracy index um, provides, a, provides a number from a zero to one. And here we see Bosnia hovering at around um, 0 0.25 across time, which is um, a pretty abysmal rating, uh, even when we when we compare it to global levels. We have um, Albania, where we do have this decoupling trend a little bit less um, obvious or, or clear than um, than for the for the overall aggregate uh, regional level, but certainly with these intersecting lines where you actually have um, formal compliance overtaking the level of democracy. Kosovo, a bit of a more um, um, up and down uh, pattern, uh, but again with um, with this um, cutting of lines and with the formal compliance being uh, above the level of, uh, of democracy. And then we very clearly see um, what we claim, uh, um, or what we described as decoupling pattern for, for Macedonia and Serbia, and also for Montenegro, although Montenegro has um, less of a clear, at least in the VDEM data, trend of democratic backsliding. So we really have this kind of opening of the scissors um, the, um, with the um, with liberal democracy declining over time very starkly in, in Macedonia and in Serbia and um, formal compliance continuing uh, its upward trend for, um, for all three countries. And so the, the aim of um, our study was then to find a theoretical explanation um, for these trends. And we articulate this, um, the, the, the theoretical model around um, the presence of state capture. And we really argue that the fact that we do have such strong Implications between um, political networks and informal networks um, that um, that really tend to take over, uh, capture um, state institutions, and play a very strong role there, is really at the heart of the struggle of EU conditionality, um, not only to overcome state capture, but um, actually to um, to even effectively address it. So we we say that um, it's not only that EU conditionality is hampered in um, in terms of um, kind of achieving the positive change that we um, saw during the initial years of Central and Eastern European transformation, but EU conditionality unintentionally, unintentionally deepens and uh, entrenches state capture in um, the Western Balkans due to the way um, it is used. And so this is um, this then goes to the, um, the pathological effect that we're trying to tease out here. So concretely, um, state capture we um, we define pretty straightforwardly as, as this process whereby informal networks gradually um, overlap with state institutions and, and lead to the fact that these tend to act more than in the interest to defend the interests of, of private actors than um, than the public interest. And our question is then, how may EU conditionality play into this relationship, into um, into the fact um, or into this process of, of, of deepening state capture? And we formulate um, three distinct mechanisms, and these are the mechanisms that you find um, in the title, this money, power, glory, um, allusion to the, to the Lana Del Rey um, uh, song. The first mechanism um, regards money. So um, simply EU funding, the assumptions EU funding sustains these informal networks. So this kind of this, this direct um, relationship um, into um, this direct uh, impact on, um, on informal networks, I'm trying to, to highlight this here. So um, basically, into this side of the equation, and this is something that has been uh, demonstrated already um, for some of the Central Eastern European countries, most prominently for um, for Orbán's Hungary, where um, really you see that EU funding allows Orbán to sustain um, business partners that are that are close to his own party, and thus to um, um, basically deepen um, and enhance his uh, his own position and his consolidate his own grip on power. So this is the first um, mechanism we formulate. The second then um, concerns power. Um, and here we, we speak to the role of conditionality basically as, a, as an additional force that 
allows the government to uh, really sidestep domestic debate, undercut domestic debate, and I think this is again um, something that we see quite prominently in the Western Balkans, that a lot of the, um, the discussion about which reforms to adopt, why even to adopt these kinds of reforms, is quite simply evacuated with reference to um, the accession process. It's already something that we saw um, in Central Eastern Europe to an extent that we had a really lack of domestic deliberation on what is the most um, promising course of the country and how should uh, reforms be designed, et cetera. And simply by saying you know, the, the overall aim driving the policy is EU accession and whatever the EU demands we do. Um, and so we, we find this quite similarly here. Um, although of course, um, the, the assumption here would be that you can even um, use conditionality then to um, kind of unjustly uh, um, try to legitimate certain um, certain steps taken by the government, such as centralization of power, um, dismantling of perhaps more more critical uh, political actors, but also non-political actors by saying we really need to emphasize speed. There is an objective lack of speed in the Western Balkans accession process, and so our assumption here is. Um, the conditionality serves as a kind of excuse to undercut domestic debate and to sideline um, parliaments, um, uh, courts, also to an extent, of course, and uh, non-institutional actors, civil society, um, and uh, and free media that may criticize the pace or, or um, risk slowing down some of the um, some of the reforms adopted um, in view of the accession process. And the third um, the third mechanism that we hypothesize we term um, glory, and so here the idea is um, a kind of legitimization of ruling elites by EU endorsements, EU endorsements in the sense of um, the formal progress that is made, and we see this um, annually with um, the, the way um, when, whenever the, the latest um, commission report is adopted, everyone of course offers their own interpretation thereof, and very clearly the interpretation of the government always goes in the direction of saying um, um, kind of highlighting the positive points and, and claiming that um, the fact that they are in power, and this is something, for instance, very strongly um, seen in Serbia, is kind of the only party that would be able to deliver and that um, that can be seen as um, as, the, as the key actor to um, to basically push this um, this accession process further. And here, this plays then directly into the state institutions. So this is this is the, the theoretical model that we call a state capture model that we um, that we put forward and that we then propose to evaluate empirically. Now, just to highlight, we've um, obviously presented this a number of times and received um, uh, some some feedback. Um, and and we also clarify this, I believe, in the text um, follow, followed on some of this uh, this input. What, what we do not claim. So we're not claiming here, it's not, it's not a simple um, EU bashing paper. I mean, we're fundamentally, I think uh, both authors um, believe that the EU accession perspective can play a positive role and are, if anything, disappointed in the fact that um, the EU has not been able to exert a, um, a more stronger um, or more strongly positive influence in the Western Balkans. So we're not claiming that EU conditionalities cause state capture. And um, so there's no counterfactual claim that had conditionality not been there, then um, there would be no, uh, no state capture, et cetera. So it's, it's really more about um, how it plays into this existing state capture in the region. So um, I, I already preempted this at this point. We don't have this counterfactual claim that in the absence of EU conditionality, we would not see um, any, um, any state capture. Uh, rather, we would probably have a similarly negative outcome, um, but without the attempt on the part of the EU to, to improve. So what we're saying is the EU is kind of unable to overcome um, this, um, this state capture um, that exists um, throughout the region. We also don't claim, this kind of goes to more, um, more quantitative or de, um, oriented study, we also don't claim to isolate the impact of EU conditionality. So we're, we're trying to, to say how it plays into the overall context, but we don't have any in this um, quantitative um, control variable um, assumption that uh, we're trying to estimate, for instance, how much um, EU conditionality um, contributes to entrenching this process. What we do say, however, is that EU conditionality has inadvertently certainly um, contributed to entrenching um, those informal networks that are present in the Western Balkans and has allowed them to strengthen their grip on power. So not only um, does state capture represent a, a real obstacle to um, positive change in the region, but the way in which conditionality has been used actually um, deepens um, the, the negative impact of um, state capture. And this is certainly something that um, would need to be revised uh, in order to allow um, the, the accession process to go forward in a, in a more productive way. 
Now, we um, demonstrate this argument, and I'm happy to maybe discuss this further also in terms of, um, of updating, of course, because I think the, the empirical um, evidence that we use in this, uh, in this study um, ends in 2018, and, and I would argue that, um, if anything, these, these trends have become um, more obvious in recent years. But we, um, we kind of demonstrate the plausibility of the state capture model with a case study of um, Serbia. And we um, then go through, through each of these um, these mechanisms, um, seeking to tease out um, the extent to which they are um, they are present and um, can be empirically verified. Now, perhaps um, what is interesting and somewhat um, in contrast with um, the way we we turned it in the study itself, um, for those of you who have got a chance to read it. We find relatively weak evidence um, for a direct impact of EU funds in terms of sustaining informal networks. So what I was saying before about um, the, the kind of Orban setup, um, but also for perhaps other Eastern European member states that have access to, uh, first of all, larger sums of EU money, um, but also perhaps due to the fact that they're um, more locally controlled um, in the countries more ability to channel these funding to um, perhaps purposes that were not immediately foreseen by the EU, um, i.e. Uh, supporting state capture. We don't find immediate evidence for this um, in the Western Balkans, which is perhaps reassuring in the sense that, um, I mean, either, of course, it's well hidden enough for us not to be able to find it, that this, this, is the obvious, um, this is the obvious alternative explanation, but may also point to the fact that um, while the EU is still mainly in charge of dis dispersing these fundings, um, th this kind of funding and the, the centralized control is at the Commission level, there is actually perhaps less um, space for domestic elites in accession countries to really um, yeah, take this money and, uh, and deviate it from its, from its initial purpose. Nonetheless, um, we suggest kind of two ways in which this money argument may play out um, nonetheless in the, in the article itself. First of all, certainly um, in the in the kind of early transformation years um, of the Western Balkans, there was a um, strong um, push for privatization of um, state-owned enterprises, um, privatization of a of a number of, of firms of companies that clearly, um, due to a lack of a rule of law um, at that uh, at that moment, very easily were then um, kind of dispatched or sold um, uh, very cheaply to. Um, to business elites that were close to um, close to power, and, and the second point, uh, and, and and this we um, again kind of more allude to than we're actually able to uh, demonstrate empirically because it's it's really tricky, um, of course, to um, to find strong empirical material on on these state capture models, is a kind of displacement of state funding. So due to the fact that the EU may be funding certain um, infrastructure projects or, or kind of very visible um, large projects, this of course frees up some part of the state funding that can, can then be channeled um, more towards informal networks, be it only through um, kind of clear incentives to um, voters to, um, to reach out to, um, or to, um, yeah, to vote for the party that's in power and to, to maintain. So somewhat mixed evidence, um, and, and I would even perhaps openly say somewhat weak evidence for this um, money um, mechanism, at least re regarding what we were able to collect for the serving case. However, moving on to the, um, the power mechanism, here we do find um, clear evidence for a number of the assumptions that we made um, of this mechanism really allowing um, the government, the ruling elites to sidestep to an undercut domestic debate. Um, first of all, we have um, very evident abuse of the urgent procedure. So um, the, the material we show in the in the article, I think, points to um, around two thirds of, of laws being adopted by the urgent procedure in Parliament, when obviously this urgent procedure is supposed to um, remain uh, in uh, or be applied only to very urgent, very kind of crucial matters and not to an, an entire government program that's being pushed through with very little time for third party input and um, very little time for, for parliamentary debate. And another point is um, the marginalization of civil society. So although um, the EU has tried um, in the Western Balkans, um, certainly more than in, in Central and Eastern Europe to involve um, civil society organizations, NGOs, broader um, kind of interest groups in the reform process, there is this very strong emphasis on um, bilateral um, exchanges between the EU and the executive in power. And this has clearly allowed um, these um, critical civil society voices in particular to be, um, to be sidestepped, all the more so with ongoing backsliding where we have this very um, clear kind of um, storization narrative and, and um, very open um, criticism and pushback against um, critical NGOs uh, in the domestic context. 
And then the final, um, the final point, uh, or the final mechanism that we investigate is, is this idea of glory of um, domestic elites using um, EU endorsements to legitimize themselves in the eyes of voters. And here again, um, it's very interesting, both in terms of media coverage, but also in terms of the information provided to me as um, kind of a Western researcher coming into um, Serbia and speaking to government representatives, just how much um, they both um, um, yeah, government controlled or media close to the government and um, individual sources um, from, from government offices, how strongly they really emphasize how many meetings would set with Merkel, um, how uh, um, Juncker is in favor of, um, of Serbian accession, how they are really the only ones um, that would be able to move the country forward. And so you very easily see the kind of narrative that you would build for um, the local population, which is even used towards um, kind of um, Western researchers to say the simple fact that um, Juncker comes to Belgrade and meets us is a sign that we um, as the SNS party are the, the ones who are and the only ones who are able to push forward this, pro um, this progress in a, in a positive direction. And of course, the fact um, that uh, the, the Commission's annual progress reports, and this maybe brings us um, bring us more to, to, to more recent years where backsliding is becoming ever more obvious, still refrain from calling out these trends explicitly um, is a way for, for the government to, um, to push away domestic critical voices and to say, look, if the, if the commission is happy um, with what we're doing, then certainly um, there can't be that much wrong with it. And, um, and this is, I think, the part that um, uh, I personally see as most problematic in the, in the working of um, conditionality that this um, that the political use and the fact that there are so many voices involved in um, formulating these reports and in, in, um, in trying to maintain also, in a sense, of course, uh, the enlargement perspective alive by offering uh, at least partially positive assessments in the end allows um, the current elites to um, to bolster their power. And this is this is also the idea that um, we try to get at with this with this stabilitocracy um, argument that we um, speak a lot uh, a lot about in the in the VIPAC context. So to, to summarize some of the, the main findings and maybe also to, to open up in the direction of a, um, of a discussion, what we claim is that EU conditionality has had really unintended side effects um, when it comes to um, deepening and entrenching state capture in the Western Balkans. Um, Certainly, this is something that is becoming more um, salient on the EU's agenda. So there have been attempts also to say um, that the regional delegations should come together, should seek to operationalize um, and state capture, should, should try and find ways to um, also um, be able to call this out more directly. And still, um, to, to, my, um, to, to, to my, um, my point of view, there's far too little emphasis on this in the, um, in the annual reports. You do have, I think, the first mention of state capture in the 2016 report on Macedonia that actually mentions the term and says that state capture is pervasive across the region and in particular um, in Macedonia um, is an issue. But basically the commission um, stops at that um, and thus on the one hand doesn't clearly point out what exactly this implies and also perhaps insufficiently reflects on the ways its own use of conditionality of course feeds into um, these kinds of processes. What we argue then is one of the, or what, one of the conclusions we draw is that most of the Western Balkan countries today are stuck in a kind of state capture trap. So they really, um, the uh, democratization is um, stagnating, and there's there's a real inability to implement deep reforms in the long term. So this is not about democratization taking longer um, than um, than in other countries due to, of course, a uh, perhaps much more problematic past than was um, the case for Central and Eastern Europe but really a, a long-term um, obstacle that, um, that is not going to go away if, if there's no change um, in, in the EU's approach or in the, um, in the attitudes in the region. And so what we then claim um, conceptually is that when we study the impact of, of conditionality and um, when we do have a number of studies that, um, that highlight this, um, these limited effects of EU conditionality in the Western Balkans, it's really important to factor in not just the, the formal dimension um, and the kind of the, the, the objective um, slowdowns on the fact that, that we still have ongoing process of nation building, we still have unclear borders on some cases, we have um, bilateral disputes, all of these of course play into the sluggish pace of reform. But most crucially really say um, it's about informal domestic politics and the way um, um, conditionality allows these informal domestic politics to continue to dominate policymaking in, um, in all the countries. 
and so perhaps thinking ahead and, and opening some of uh, some avenues for, for our discussion, what would be needed so to, to really overcome this current um, state capture trap and the fact that the uh, that the EU is really struggling to have any kind of um, positive impact in the region. And here we um, we consider that it's um, the domestic deliberation is really key and the deli domestic deliberation way beyond the um, the accession process itself, of course, sorry, the accession process itself, but um, really in the sense of um, allowing a, a genuine domestic um, debate to emerge around the direction in which the country is headed, the reasons why um, this con the, the country is headed in this direction. So what are some of the objectives beyond kind of obtaining this uh, this stamp of approval of EU membership M more deeply speaking what are um, what are these countries what are um, the leaders in these countries seeking to achieve for this um, uh, for for their own uh, future and for their own citizens much more so than an incentive driven change um, and uh, and this is something we, we, we see um, similarly for for central and eastern Europe of course that once we do have this very instrumental very incentive driven transformation it only goes so far and I think um, if there's one lesson to be learned from um, democratic backsliding in Hungary and Poland, it's certainly that there needs to be a, a deeper domestic anchoring of, of the reform process on at the level of citizens, but also, of course, at the level of, um, of elites in order to ensure a more long term um, sustainability of such crucial um, issues as um, the rule of law. Again, something that we see as a major challenge inside the EU and of the, of the broader um, democratic reforms. That, um, that are adopted throughout the accession process. So I'm happy to um, respond to any um, specific questions on, um, on the study or uh, of course also to engage in um, broader discussion on, on the issue of how can the EU conditionality either effectively overcome state capture or perhaps just in general contribute to a democratic transformation of the Western Balkans. Can it even? I mean, perhaps it's also an open question. Um, and so for those of you who didn't get a chance to, to look at the article, it's, it's open access. You can um, read all the, all the details um, there. And then I look forward to your questions now. Great. Thank you very much, Natasha, for sharing this uh, insights and the research uh, with us.